He was not a college educated man, but he's still the smartest man I've ever known. He um, was in the Air Force, uh, worked in the certain space agencies in the military, did telemetry tracking, was really smart with math, and told me that he had to convince his supervisor to actually get a computer in the 80s out on a military base. He said, look, computers are the future. We need a computer. They were still recording things on tape reels where he worked. And um, one day he was telling me, he said, Trent, do you want these old Encyclopedia Britannicas? And I was like, why? He's like, because I'm getting rid of them. I was like, why? He was like, well, I got Encarta. I was like, OK. And he used Encarta for several years. And he promptly called me the other day and told me, Encarta sucks. And I was like, well, why are you still using it, Papa? Use Wikipedia. And he said, you know what, you're right. And he spent a week on Google and Wikipedia. And this is what he called to tell me. He said, I have Google and Wikipedia, which means I have the world. I can do anything. And I was like, yeah, that's right. He promptly sold his Encyclopedia Britannicas, which as somebody who does have sort of a, I don't want to say book fetish, but has a certain love for former authority printed volumes, um, I found that kind of sad. But he is right. The problem with printed material, the problem that Wikipedia does not have, which is something I continually try to get across to my colleagues, is that it is not static. Printed volumes and all their greatness are essentially static until the next one comes out. Knowledge, this is it. Between E and F, this is all the knowledge in the world. And that is it. And goodness knows we all know that is ridiculous. OK? Uh, so let's pretend that we're all wrong. Let's pretend. This is an exercise I do with my students. Let's pretend we're all wrong. And every professor, every teacher, every person you've ever met is wrong. They're just wrong. Okay. What would you say to that person to convince them that you're right? Because if everyone is wrong, how can somebody be right? And one of my students remarked to me, well, I would just convince them. I'm like, oh, <laughs> well, of course. Jesus. Of course you're going to try and convince them, but how? How are you going to convince somebody? And this is one of my older students, an adult returning student. He said, well, I would give them a dictionary, and I, I would tell them to start reading from the front to the back. When they get to the back, we're going to have to talk about words. I'm like, well, you could just look it up online. It's like, I'm scared of the internet. People are still scared of the internet. And it's something, unfortunately, I have to fight against. And in a conversation I had with one of my students, I thought, well, you know, print is actually antithetical to ev evolution. Because knowledge is not something that is static. We are not in a modernist, as Latour would say, we have never been modern. We're not in a modernist, romanticized notion, OK? I recall what one of my Rodney teachers once told me. She said, Trent, you have an idea that the romantic writer still exists pounding away on his keys, oh, like murder she wrote, right? Pounding on the typewriter, throwing the paper off, and you're done. And she said, that does not exist. It never has existed. And the same can be said, of course, of knowledge. And this is where it gets really interesting, or so I think. Why would I want my students to have access to Wikipedia? They can get all their material from me. One of my history colleagues told this to me as I was trying to convince him to let his students use an uh, entry on Wikipedia for the American Civil War. This gentleman happens to be an expert on the Civil War, and therefore everything on Wikipedia is wrong. And I said, well, how are you so sure it's wrong? He said, well, it's wrong. I was like, well, well, how are you an expert? How are you an expert? He's like, well, I went to school. I'm like, well, OK, you went to school. So what? Who cares? Who gives a shit? Right? He's like, well, I do. I went to school for my PhD. And it was at Yale. Nothing against Yale. OK, but it was at Yale. And, and I know what I'm talking about. I've written two books. I'm like, yeah, and they're probably out of date by now. They came out last year. Yeah, I know. They're out of date. 
Okay. So just hold on to that thought as we move forward. Okay. Let's bring some terms in. Uh, Aristotle and some terms. Old dead white guy. I'm assuming he was old, he was a white guy. I was not alive at that time, so I cannot be sure. And he's a famed rhetorician, teacher of rhetoric. And here are two terms that are pretty important as we develop sort of authority online. Hexus and ethos. Now, hexus is also the root of Rador's habitus, okay? That is to have, okay? And ethos is sort of the building of authority. How do we present ourselves? How does persuasion happen? And I don't want to read this long thing from On Rhetoric, okay? Um, just because. Suffice to say, uh, he talks about how when we persuade, when the retor, the speaker, okay, in this case the writer, okay, the entity, as it were, is trying to persuade, he uses three things, okay? This is traditional classical rhetoric. He uses pathos, which is the appeal to passion, the appeal to emotion, okay? We often see this in presidential speeches, right? Patriotism, right? It's a very emotional response, even though it's just a word. Okay. Logos, okay, we often see attorneys use logos to make a logical argument. And ethos, as in, why do I have the right to stand up here and tell you about this? What authority do I have? And this is the problem with Wikipedia, as some of my colleagues see it. Is that the knowledge is there, but there's no authority. Just, I want you to think about that for a minute. Um, an example, postnomials, PhD, are essentially meaningless outside of certain contexts. Okay? I'm getting a PhD in something. Anime. Huh? Anime. Anime? Yes. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting a PhD and I, I don't want to be all downtrodden, mean academic person, but I'm getting a PhD in, I don't know, Derrida's understanding of basket weaving in 24th century Greece. See, I'm even going ahead, okay? But they definitely mean nothing outside of certain contexts. You know, it's the context, which happens to be Derrida, I pull from Derrida and ideas, context that rules sort of the message that we have. And so what is the authority structure when we talk about, oh, well, this, this is something that a PhD person wrote. This is something a person wrote, okay? And this is something that I have difficulty, have difficulty explaining to my students. This is something that a person wrote. Forget that they went somewhere. Forget that they stood in a classroom for six years, or they sat in a classroom and they listened to somebody talk to them. Okay. It's just a person wrote that. Which means, since it's just a person that wrote it, it's entirely subjective. And indeed, in presenting our sort of ethos, meaning, symbology of the object, narration, and presentation sort of helps us develop our ethos. So how can we do this on Wikipedia that would get tenured, white-haired, three-piece suit-wearing, Harvard-educated professors who probably should retire to trust it? This is how I explain it. Wikipedia is a discovery engine, not just a repository of information. Here's an example. How the sea day led to an opera house, a student experience. I tried to make a video for this, but my actors weren't cooperating. They were my students. They kept telling me, no, Trent, we don't want to make a video. I'm like, you know what? You're making a video. And then I felt bad. So we didn't. But anyways, I had a student do a paper on Bastille Day, which happens to be today. Happy Bastille Day, everybody. OK. And um, he told me, yeah, I was looking at Bastille Day. Then I saw something else that was in blue. It was a link, and I followed it. OK, good, good, this is good. He's like, and then, then I saw something else that looked interesting. I saw a picture or something, and I followed it. And I was like, OK, good, 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 keep going. And this journey of his, which started with a paper about Bastille Day, ended up being a paper about an opera house in Naples, Italy. And I was pleasantly surprised. 
And I said, well, why did you go with the Opera House? He said, well, you know, Bastide sounded interesting, but the Opera House looked cool. And I was like, oh, it looked cool. Well, it is cool. You should go there sometime. I was like, it is cool. He was like, well, I don't like opera. It's boring, but I think the building looks cool. I was like, oh, well, thanks for dashing my hopes. <laughs> I love my students. I swear I love my students. Um, and so he ended up writing a paper about this opera house in Naples. And I told him to leave the anecdote about Bastide in there as a way to talk about discovery. And we're going to talk more about students in a minute. What time am I at? Am I good? Um, so let's bring somebody else into this conversation. Kenneth Brufy um, is a comp compositionist, rhetorician, educator, all around good guy, I guess. You know. And uh, he wants to remark, he said, we converse, we internalize conversation, and then by writing, we reimmerse conversation in, in its external social medium. And perhaps his most important idea is that knowledge is not definite, but instead is what together we agree it is for the time being within a knowledge network. E.g., a chair is only a chair because we say it is. It could easily be a tree. I'm, try I'm, I'm on a mission to get people to start calling chairs trees to to work. I, nobody's taken me up on the offer. I will gladly send you a box of Girl Scout cookies if you will do it. Thin mints only. But Brufy is really important in writing. Okay? And since Wikipedia is essentially written discourse, okay, broadly defined, this means that everybody who has contributed to written discourse it can be considered in and of themselves, if we go by the standard term of academic, an academic, anybody, and rightly so. The worrying academic, that should be the title of a blog, I think. Maybe I'll start it. Academics worry because their jobs, their job is based on their privileged position within knowledge cartels. I'll never forget at a conference, I mentioned to somebody that a colleague of mine was doing similar work. And this is what they said to me. That, that's my work. It's mine. They even banged on the table like that. I said, you know what? It's not yours. This incarnation is yours. This work has been going on since the beginning of time. And I got all zen-like. Oh, namaste. But cartels decided what constitutes knowledge and everything else is ridiculous. What is particularly irritating for me as an academic, as a writing teacher, as just a teacher in general, is when I see friends of mine marking up student work and discounting it because they used Wikipedia. It's like, well, what is the difference between the Encyclopedia Britannica and Wikipedia? Here's the main difference. A board of privileged people sat around and said, yeah, that definition looks good. Let's put it in there. On Wikipedia, everybody who is part of this social community has refined the idea and continues to refine it until we get it right, if there is or is such a thing. Indeed, I really think I'm just going to start carrying around, and whether you like Latour or not, Bruno Latour, I'm just going to start carrying Latour books around and throwing them at people. Say, even if you don't like him, read it. Read it. We will carry with us no preconceptions of what constitutes knowledge. And indeed, what is sort of, I don't know how to, messed up. Let's just say messed up. I was thinking of another word, but I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be uh, less vulgar than I am when I teach. So... Um, Wikipedia fundamentally serves the public good, and this is what irritates some of my academic colleagues so much, I think. All right. I've always seen higher education as an institution that is meant to serve the public good. Uh, it's meant to serve the community in which it thrives, in which it is made possible. This is not always the case. And Wikipedia for all its props and cons and everything has faults, so I will say some faults, 
it fundamentally serves public good. It serves students, it serves regular people, it serves my grandfather. Okay? My grandfather who never had the opportunity to sit in a classroom and you know, have a discussion with people. And that's pretty important to me. So why would universities and academics disparage something that they should be doing? I suppose that's actually way too long and probably another conversation, another presentation, another conversation, another day. But it seems that the current trend within higher education is that, well, given all the economic circumstances, is that we must protect the only thing that we have that is valuable, and that is knowledge. It is ours. It is what gives professors credence. It is what gives them a job. Teaching, imparting, investigating. I want my Encarta back. That should say something no one has ever said. Clearly. Why should I give a rat's ass what some board of pretentious academics tells me is knowledge when I could just look it up in two seconds? One of my more vulgar students. Quote, curriculum of the damned. Looking for odor eaters. Another anecdote. How does a student do a presentation on odor eaters? The foot powder? Yeah. We get into all kinds of crazy stuff in my class. I've had condom presentations, female birth control, odor eaters, girdles. Maybe it's not my students, maybe it's just me. Because uh, <laughs> I don't know of any student who would actively say, I'm going to go investigate odor eaters. Yay. That costs four bucks at CVS. Um, but I had a student do a presentation on odor eaters one time. And he said, well, I found out the company that makes odor eaters on Wikipedia. And I was like, okay. I was like, did you cite it? And he was like, no. It's 3 o'clock. It's 3 o'clock, by the way. And um, <laughs> my computer talks to me. <sighs> That's sad. That's so sad. Okay, anyways, let me keep going. I have five minutes left, so. Um, looking for odor eaters. So I had a student uh, tell me he was, he, I asked my student if he cited where he found that information. He said, well, no, I didn't cite it. He said, because one of my teachers would just mark it off, so I just didn't cite it. I was like, well, how are they going to know that you know that? How are they going to know where you found that? So that's the point of you know, citing things. Is so, well, in a perfect world, the idea is that, oh, look, he cited this. I want to go read that. Not, oh, he cited this, and that's shitty, okay? which has been the case. And he said, well, I found an odor eater's parent company. And they have a very interesting history. And I just hope you really love my paper. It was a good paper. It was boring, but it was good. And I even told him, I said, you know, most teachers love reading papers. I do, but not about odor eaters. I said, surely there was some linked data there that you could have crossed over to something else. I love Wikipedia, it writes my papers for me. Wait, how the hell did people research before Wikipedia? I've never been to my library. Wikipedia reminds me of why I hate my classes. <laughs> I should really give my students credit because they give me so much good material. Um, <laughs> Wikipedia reminds me of... You should attribute that. Hmm? You should attribute <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's true. That's true. Uh oh. I have a feel. I told my students I would be doing this and to follow along on Twitter if they wanted. I, I, I imagine I'm going to have tons of uh, mentions. That's not what I said. It's like, no, that is what you said. I recorded you. Okay. <laughs> uh, we live in public, right? Okay. So, what if it reminds me of why I hate my classes? And um, not my class, thank God. But why this one student hates his classes, mostly because he can never use it, even though it's a good source of information. And a way to treat students in order to get around this is I suggested, don't cite right from Wikipedia, but see what Wikipedia cites. OK? Sometimes that's the best we can do, unless you get one of those stubs that like nothing is cited. It's like, please help us build this. It's like, well, OK, I will. Let me finish with the story. I'm almost done. Paulo Ferrer, to educate is essentially to form. Uh, 
favorite book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And uh, it reminds me of something really important is that when we're on Wikipedia, what's particularly important for students or anyone who uses it is that it is essentially a form of self-education, Wikipedia. And I've had the pleasure of a very understanding department chair where I am, basically lets me do whatever I want. And I said, well, I'm going to teach a class where students are only allowed to cite Wikipedia. That's it. And she said, are you crazy, Trent? And I said, well, yeah, but still, don't let me do it. And she was, <laughs> she was like, well, I'm not usually in the mind of letting crazy people do things, but the academy attracts that type, so we shall go with it. And what came out of the experiment is that my students ended up forming vastly more in-depth opinions about the world than they ever would have had they simply read whatever book I had assigned for that or whatever thing they had read. They learned how to investigate knowledge, how to follow leads, linked data, how to see how to cite, how to edit Wikipedia to improve it, to make it better. And they came to me and they said, I have one minute. No, I have one minute. That's not what they said. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, they came to me and they said, we want to use Wikipedia for every class. We want to use it for every single class. And I said, well, then you need to go tell your teacher that. And he'll probably say, no. And when he says no, what do you say? And I said, you tell him, well, no, we want to use it. It's like, well, we can't do that. I was like, no. And I guess this is the radical in me, but we should challenge the people that oppress us, even when they are our university, oppressor, university professors. And I remember one time I challenged one of my professors, and he ended up giving me a failing grade on an assignment. And this is in doctoral school, so I promptly secured one of his articles that was published in a journal and graded it. <laughs> and marked it up, because I'm a writing teacher, so I can be a grammar meanie, and I won. <laughs> I would not do that with everybody, nor would I ask one of my freshman students to do that, because they would probably cry. But uh, I think that we definitely need to, as I finish, give academics their juice box. Give them their, give them their research, give them their citations, but I think the important thing is that Sometimes we need to be militant. We need to take Wikipedia to the masses. And we need to drag college universities, professors, into the 21st century. Not everyone could be David Souter, who famously doesn't even have email or cell phone. Well, how do you check Wikipedia is my question. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I am Benjamin Mako Hill, and I am a Wikipedian and a uh, member of the Foundation's Advisory Board and a uh, fellow at the Berkman Center for Internet and Society. I'm a, I sometimes describe myself as a sort of rebel with rather too many causes. Um, uh, and anyway, I'm going to talk a little bit today about um, a piece of research that I've done, which is uh, which I call almost Wikipedia. Um, and uh, this is, uh, I don't know, I gave a couple other talks in the conference which were um, sort of less about specific pieces of academic research. Um, this is really sort of a, a, a paper that I've written. Um, and so I'm going to try to sort of summarize this for the audience and, I mean, keep in mind that it's, uh, and, and skip through some of the more sort of, I don't know, the parts which will be of less interest to this particular audience. So. I'll tell you a little bit about my own research. I study free and open source. I come from sort of free and open source software communities, and, and I study them. Um, and I uh, mostly study a lot of. I've do done a lot of work looking at remixing communities, and a lot of work looking at sort of online collaboration more broadly. And of course, I've done a bunch of research in Wikipedia. Um, a lot of this interest uh, in academia, I'm not the only person doing this work. I mean, the reason a lot of academics, the reason there's a lot of academics here trying to present their work is because they're sort of impressed with what's happened with uh, uh, Wikipedia and with the sort of high quality that's come about. And the idea here, the sort of story that people tell, is that the reason we're interested in what, we, what some people call sort of peer production, meaning sort of like online collaboration, is, is because when uh, there's this idea that, that, that when a lot of people get together, they can sort of work and produce really high quality stuff. That because there's so many people who are contributing to Wikipedia, it's both very big but also very good. 
Um, the large majority of research in this field has focused on the most collaborative and successful examples of the project. Um, uh, there are, this is a graph of papers published on Wikipedia each year. As you can see, it's like, we're, at, we're at somewhere at 300 pages a year. It looks like we might have more than 300 papers on Wikipedia published this year alone, right? There are tons and tons of research in Wikipedia, thousands of, um, thousands of papers. There are conferences, including the one that you're sitting at, which is about Wikipedia. Um, and again, I mentioned it's based, it's based on this idea, this model, that if we publish things openly, um, uh, the community will come in and improve them, and as a result, we'll get higher quality. The reason we think that we, we encourage people to, to you know, put it on a wiki, right, is because if we, the idea is that if we put it on a wiki, um, uh, or if we sort of publish our code out there in like a free or an open source software project, that people will come in, they will start fixing our bugs, and through that process, we'll end up with really cool, good, high quality stuff. And what I want to argue is that that bit right there, so I mean, I come from these communities. I've done this a lot. I've actually uh, created, um, dozens of examples of uh, free and open source software projects. I run a little wiki farm of my own, where I have a bunch of my own little wikis that I run. Um, and what I've noticed is that very often the, 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 this this process where you sort of attract the community tends to be a tends to be a pretty tricky one. So so just as a sort of like a uh, an idea here, what do people think the average number of contributors are to a uh, free or open source software project? Any ideas? Up here. I would guess most of them are less than gigantic, uh, less than 20. Less than 20. Uh, one. one. So the answer is one. This is a list of all the source forge. Uh, uh, this is the this is a, this is a list of all the source forge projects, right? And this is unfair in some sense because this is just even ideas for projects. If we look at only um, so, what do people think the average number is? If we look at at uh, at at let's say mature projects or even the top 10 percent of projects which have been downloaded, you know, hundreds of times, the average then. One. The average is one. The, the answer, I mean, I can keep doing this um, over and over, right? Um, um, the, the, the average number of contributors to a wiki of wiki. A wiki on wiki. It's not one. It's actually like five. Um, um, but, but four of them are bots or something like that. Um, uh, no. 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 Uh, the, the point is, is that the, uh, the average number of, uh, uh, I've done a bunch of work on remixing communities um, where people can upload projects and the idea is people come in and remix them. The average number of remixes? Like one, right? This graph is like, it's like, I mean, I, I, could, I could spend days just uh, uh, making and showing these things. The reality is, is that the vast majority of attempts at peer production um, sort of never really take off. And although we've done a huge amount of, um, uh, uh, and, um, so this idea is that only, uh, you know, the, the, the vast majority of things never take off. They never take off not in the sense that they don't produce something good. Very often they do produce something good. They don't take off in the sense that they don't become very collaborative. Um, um, even when they are producing something good. One person alone can produce great stuff. But actually creating these collaborative projects tends to be something that's, that, that's really tricky. And to the extent that, the, that, that the, collabor the collaborativeness is what we find interesting about this, the fact that we're only looking at the successful projects means that although we've done written thousands of papers about how Wikipedia works, we don't really know why Wikipedia works um, because we don't know which of the things it does are sort of essential for the causal process of of attracting those volunteers and becoming very collaborative, right? There's a big sort of gap in our research. And this is sort of what my broad body of uh, research is trying to look at. Um, so here's the sort of research question, right? Why do some peer production projects successfully attract contributors while most do not? So I'm, gonna I'm looking at projects, um, I'm looking at attracting contributors, and I'm actually interested in contributing because very often what you'll see is that getting people to sign up is much easier than getting them to do work, right? Getting people, to, and in fact, most people who create accounts in Wikipedia never make an edit. Um, um, uh, and, and the literature so far has basically not addressed this question in um, very, very directly because we've done, for example, lots of surveys of Wikipedians. We say, why are people contributing? And it's useful to know because we might want them to contribute more. But from a structural perspective, I mean, I create wikis. I create wikis all the time. Um, and they almost never work. And I'm incredibly frustrated by the fact that I don't know how to make those wikis work. And so that's sort of the question that keeps me up at night. Um, so, so the idea here is to say, if we want, so, 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 so I talked about this idea that, that we don't why Wikipedia works. And the idea is that, w that to really understand why Wikipedia works, we need to not just look at what Wikipedia does. We need to look at all the sort of failed Wikipedias, right? Like, and we need to say, what did they do different than, than the one that worked? So wouldn't it be great if we had a bunch of failed Wikipedias, right? Um, so it turns out there were a bunch of failed Wikipedias. Um, 
at least failed in the sense that they never became as big and successful and mobilized as many contributors as Wikipedia did. Um, there were eight attempts to create online collaborative encyclopedias released for, whose content was released freely before Wikipedia was founded in 2001. Um, uh, and so all of these projects sort of called themselves encyclopedia, or the press um, called them encyclopedias, even if they didn't. Um, and, I've, uh, uh, and all of them sort of were collaborative in the sense that they were sort of trying to crowdsource work from volunteers. There was actually another project which was trying to sort of pay people to write, I mean, other than like the commercial encyclopedias, paying like random people on the internet to write encyclopedia articles. But I'm, I'm not including that not here. And as far as I know, this includes all of the attempts at creating online collaborative encyclopedias before Wikipedia. Um, I'm actually currently looking at projects which were created in sort of the first year of Wikipedia. And if you know of projects that I haven't listed here, I'd really like to hear about it because I'm not, this paper isn't finished yet. So I'm, I'd love to like continue to build on this. Um, this is the list of the projects that I have up here. You may be familiar with a couple of them. Um, the first one is Interpedia. It was created before the web. Um, uh, um, the second was called the Distributed Encyclopedia, which was created by someone who became a sort of major contributor to Wikipedia. Um, and the idea was is that people would host the uh, pages on the separate websites, um, on their own websites, and then it would, it would sort of like be linked together from one place. Um, people may have used everything to or um, everything before it. It was sort of a, an, uh, an early encyclopedia project, which actually sort of changed to being, once Wikipedia became very successful, sort of decided to promote more uh, creative writing and things like that. But a very cool project. Um, which had actually quite a lot of contributors and articles um, and still exists. H2G2 was the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy Earth Edition. Uh, it's a super cool project. Um, it was actually created like sort of with Douglas Adams. Um, uh, uh, and it was sort of like an encyclopedia but written from a sort of irreverent, sort of funny tone, kind of like the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy would be if it were written. Um, uh, the Info Network was uh, an amazing project. The, the Info Network, the early versions of the Info Network looked more like Wikipedia than Wikipedia did when it launched. Wikipedia does today. Newpedia people probably heard of. It was the project created by the people who created Wikipedia before they created Wikipedia. Um, there was one called Gnupedia, which was uh, started by people from the free software movement. Uh, so GNU, sort of like hackers, um, and also sort of was around for a while. Um, as you can see, uh, the Interpedia was founded like very early on, um, and it was sort of before the web, so there's some reason to believe that maybe that was like, uh, uh, maybe just a little too early, an idea before its time. But actually most of the rest of them existed at the same time, and most of them existed sort of contemporaneously with Wikipedia for a long period of time, um, around 2001. Um, um, what I've done for this, what I've done for this is, uh, in order to sort of answer this, answer this big question, right? Why did these, why did Wikipedia succeed, but these other projects didn't? What I've done is I've gone and tried to find the founders of these projects, and I've done interviews with, um, I've, inter I've done interviews with all the sort of pe if pe people from all of the projects. I'm continuing to do more um, as I can sort of track people down. Um, I also got together tons of email, web, sort of like discussion forum uh, descriptions of how these projects worked, um, uh, newspaper coverage, planning discussions, so I can see how people are working on it. Um, um, with the idea of uh, um, sort of uh, walking through this and sort of trying to figure out what these projects are doing differently and, what, and, and why Wikipedia succeeded. And I got to tell you, when you talk to these people, like these are people who basically, like, like it's very hard to get them to talk about anything other than why their project didn't succeed where Wikipedia didn't, right? Like these are people who've been thinking for the last 10 years, like, why didn't my project, like, like watching Wikipedia, like, you know, like become Wikipedia, right? Or like, man. Um, uh, but what's nice is now, it's, because it's been 10 years, they're like, am I bitter? Yeah, maybe I was before. I kind of got, they're like, they've sort of reached this sort of like Zen state, like people have sort of dealt with it, right? So I'm doing a sort of, a, uh, um, I did a bunch of sort of qualitative methods where I transcribed a bunch of interviews and sort of coded it using um, a set of terms. So I sort of, I sort of basically tagged the text and then looked for um, sort of, and then tagged the tags and then sort of looked for themes to emerged throughout this. And the result um, was a set of four propositions, um, sort of four theories. And these, are, and these are theories that I can't test, right? I can't say that these things are true for sure based on the nature of this message, because I'm not testing theory here. I can just say that these are things that, that these data and that the people that I talk to have sort of told me. And what's interesting is that I'm doing in some quantitative work. I'm actually taking some big data sets of hundreds of thousands of wikis and actually testing to see if these things you know, really are associated with increased mobilization in, in uh, projects going forward. But that's something I'll present next year if everything goes well. Um, anyway, I had four sort of takeaways. The first was that Wikipedia attracted contributors because it was built around a familiar product. And I'm going to talk about all of these in a little more depth. The second was that Wikipedia attracted contributors because it focused on substantive content development instead of technology. 
Um, the third idea was that Wikipedia attracted contributors because it offered low transaction costs associated with participation. And the fourth was that they uh, de-emphasized attribution through social ownership of content. And I'll tell you, if you don't understand what any or all of these mean, that's fine. Um, so the first idea, this idea of sort of, I already mentioned, was this idea of a familiar product. Um, and Wikipedia's um, familiar product was very key to its success. Here's a, here's a quote from one of the founders of Everything 2, who said, I don't think we ever used the term encyclopedia, and that probably would have been smart. Wikipedia had a, bunch of, uh, had, a, had, a, had a much more focused purpose than Everything 2. Everything 2 was just by its nature sort of Zen Cohen like Like everyone who was involved with it sort of thought it completely defined description. And that, I think, was to its, ultimately to its detriment. Versus Wikipedia, which is like, we're going to build th this encyclopedia like the world book, but huge and comprehensive. We're going to keep this impartial tone, and everything has to be referenced and that sort of thing. Wikipedia, um, uh, uh, Wiki, uh, Wikipedia attracts contributors because its product goal is very familiar with potential contributors. And the failed product sort of deviated from this model. The idea here is, is that people showed up at Wikipedia. I mean, there's thousands of pages of documentation right, in Wikipedia about, how to, about like, what neutral point of view means, about what notability means. But, you, but here's the secret, right? And I'm an, I, I've, got, you know, I've made many thousands of edits in Wikipedia. You don't actually have to read any of them. You can even win arguments without reading any of them. If you just say encyclopedic, encyclopedic over and over, it's like you basically know the rule. Um, because because notability basically um, you can you can get pretty far with notability if you just think that notability means the kinds of things which are in traditional encyclopedias, and you can get pretty far with neutrality if you say the kind of way in which traditional encyclopedias are written. And as a result, people who showed up to Wikipedia sort of knew exactly how um, what was expected of them in terms of in terms of how to contribute to the project, and it made it much easier for those people to, to contribute. And a lot of these other projects that, that sort of deviated from this, that, 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 that like the previous example said, sort of tried to sort of explore what an online encyclopedia would, would look like, really sort of um, struggled as a result. Um, so here's an example of this. Um, Everything 2 described itself as a flexible web database, which seeks to find the best way to store and links idea. The result, it's absolutely crazy. It's like, okay, it's absolutely crazy, but like, what, what do I do? Um, uh, ooh, I just blanked the screen. Um, another person said, I, don't, I, don't, I didn't conceive of it as, let's put an encyclopedia online. I thought, this is going to be an exploration, and we're going to figure out what a reference work online looks like, right? Truly really trying to sort of explore what's going online. Um, Here's an example from H2G2. Um, the guy said, uh, they described some of the problems that contributors had by the fact that they were just a little bit different. Now, H2G2, remember, is just an online encyclopedia written in like a slightly funny way. And it said, one of the problems was people would be writing completely fictional stuff about the universe, you know, about the Hitchhiker's universe. And we'd go, no, 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 you're not getting it. This is for real people. This is about the real world. And then, at the same time, what they did, they'd also do stuff about the real world, but try and write it from the point of view of an intergalactic guide. So we'd get articles about soccer that would start with, on the planet Earth, which is the third planet out from the solar system soul, the humans like to play blah, 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 blah. Shut up, all right? It's like, this is going to be read by humans who live on Earth. Um, we had piles and piles of that shit, and we had to shovel our way out from under it, right? So, <laughs> So it's an example of how these projects, which, which, um, which deviated in some ways just a little bit from what, from, from what traditional encyclopedic frames um, were doing, really struggled to do this. And if you look at the big successful free and open source projects, GNU's not Unix, right? GNU, it's a bit like Unix. In fact, it's exactly like Unix. Um, um, uh, um, that's, the, that's, why, that's why GNU is a joke. It's like a hacker joke. Um, uh, uh, like, like uh, uh, if you look at OpenOffice, it's a bit like some other programs we may, have, we may know, right? Look at the big successful free and open source software projects. They tend to be based around ideas that people are pretty familiar with. And as a result, pe people can come and can participate in these projects and contribute because they know what it is that they're trying to produce. Um, another proposition two. Um, Wikipedia attracted contributors because its founders were focused on evangelizing and attracting content creators. And the failed pro pro projects often focused on building technical capacity to support contributions. Um, so in any case, the idea here is that, that, that um, uh, uh, every project in the sample, except, Wiki, except Wikipedia and Newpedia, were founded by technologists, right? They were all founded by like, hackers and programmers. Um, every one of these projects, including Newpedia, other than Wikipedia, wrote their own software. In Wikipedia, they just took some wiki software. And well, Wiki, Wikipedia did write its own software, eventually. But it wrote it, but it, wrote it much later, actually. It just used some off-the-shelf thing for, for a period of time. Um, uh, in most of these other projects, most of the resources, or even all of the resources, were dedicated to technological and procedural cap capacity. Um, for example, one of the, the one of the founders told me he mentioned in, in an interview for an in an hour long interview. I, I said, what, "What did your project do better than Wikipedia? Our URLs were much better." And he was right. Wikipedia URLs are super bad. These like index.php, and you get the whole long list trying to find the revision ideas. His were very clear. But you know what? The quality of your URLs is not going to cause your project to succeed or fail, or at least it didn't in this particular case. 
Um, uh, one of the projects had three competing technological implement implementations, 200 different people, and only test content. They had a huge community of people building the stuff to build the encyclopedia, but they never built the encyclopedia. Right? Um, another Intrapedia had four software implementations, 400 participa participants, and, and, and basically very little content. A, a, a few articles here and there, but very little, right? It was all about sort of te technologists building infrastructure. And as a result, they never created the thing to which people would want to go and build. Wikipedia, Wikipedia software was bad. You couldn't like create an article. You still can't create an article with a lowercase letter. Right, uh, and, and the first one. There's some JavaScript sort of like lowercase that, right? Um, you couldn't initially create an, every article had to be like at least three letters long and have the first letter be capital and have the, another letter be capital that's not the end one. I mean, it was crazy, but, um, but, but the project succeeded because, they, because the, the energy and effort was going into building the content. So um, the info network uh, uh, described his role in the project as, I had this notion that my job was to provide the platform, like writing the code and not the content, that was the community's job. But since there was no community, it just didn't happen. And so I felt, I kept trying to refine the user interface and things like that to make it more inviting for people could write stuff. But, but I didn't realize that to really get started, I just had to, there's only so much you can do by making the interface easier to use. You just have to get writers or write stuff yourself. Um, uh, one of the uh, founder from GNE described the necessary resources. He said, I said, what did you need? To, 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 to make this project a success. Well, we needed, uh, we needed uh, server capacity, you know, um, we were deciding how much content we'd have, so we needed to have space and room and bandwidth and all that kind of stuff, right? So they spent so much time worrying about where they would put the stuff, like where they would get the servers to put the stuff, that they never got the stuff in the first place. Um, and what's interesting is that very often these people, they see te Wikipedia as very technologically unsophisticated. Um, a person from Wikipedia, which is a project from 1993, I said, what could you learn from Wikipedia? And he says, a lot of the stuff in Wikipedia is extremely obvious and not very sophisticated. I mean, Wikipedia is not high tech. I always imagine something high tech, that's my nature. I envision things that are at a higher technical level. We envision for the Wikipedia as something that would be high tech. And we can see the Wikipedia inspiring Wikipedia, but not the other way around, right? It's still hard for them to see things that they could learn because they're thinking very technologically about these projects. Um, Wikipedia's founders um, uh, saw their role as soliciting content. Um, I think the smart thing that Larry Sanger did uh, and that I would probably try to do would be to solicit academic experts and other people to try to write and seed articles. Something that, that, that Wikipedia's founders were very involved in. Um, Someone, someone else cited Jimmy Wales and his role saying, I think, uh, I think we didn't have a strong evangelist out there getting people to contribute as, as one of the uh, struggles that they had. Point three, um, Wikipedia attracted contributors because it offered lower transaction costs and the failed models had higher costs. So by, by transaction costs here, this is kind of an academic term, but, uh, um, but the basic idea is that there are these little costs associated with like, like what you want to do is contribute, right? And let's say I want to um, contribute just, uh, uh, let, let, let's say like, like I, I want to fix a, I see a comma that's it's missing in an article and it bothers me and I want to fix it, right? Now if it's in Britannica, I can, I can write a letter, I can go find a stamp, I can mail it to them, right? But I, I'm bothered by the missing comma, but I'm not bothered that much. I'm not bothered so much to find a piece of paper and to, and, and to send it in, right? Um, now, I am bothered enough that I'll press edit and fix it really quickly, right? Um, so the idea here is, is that these little costs, um, like the 44, I don't know, how much does a stamp cost? No, <laughs> I use the forever stamps. Um, uh, uh, but, but, but like, whatever, the, the 40 some cents for a stamp, I don't care that much. Um, so little, these little costs, things like creating an account, like logging in, like learning complicated markup, these sorts of things. All of these things, although they're sometimes very small, relative to the nature of the contribution, they can actually sometimes play a big role in deterring content. Um, so here's a quote from an H2G2 person says, I think describing how Wikipedia offered lower costs associated with contributing. It says, I think it's the immediacy of it. And certainly one of the aspects was the fact that you didn't have to sign up to edit. I mean, you can look at a page and see something wrong and immediately edit without having to do anything else, you know? Um, you can come along and do a drive-by edit and never be involved again and make a contribution. You can't do a drive-by on, on any other project. Drive-by edit. Um, um, Another example, the distributed encyclopedia failed because the building encyclopedia articles using handcraft HTML was being too complex. Wikis solved the problem um, uh, very nicely. But cost alone seemed limited in explaining this failure, right? One founder suggested that lower, um, only one founder suggested that lower contributions, um, that lower, uh, sorry, lower transaction costs were the most important reason for Wikipedia's success. Um, and several art projects argued that their, that, their, that their project was effectively as easy to contribute to Wikipedia. A lot of these projects had no logins, had no markup to learn. They were actually very easy. Um, for example, one, he said, so, you know, describing how it was a problem, he says, one problem was the mandatory preview step before you saved it, which probably wasn't enough to kill the site single-handedly, but I probably would have changed it. Wikipedia does fine without that, having a mandatory preview step. 
Point four, and f at my final point. Wikipedia attracted contributors because low attribution facilitated less individual social ownership of work products and sort of socially risky collaboration. Um, most failed projects uses stronger attributions and more territoriality. So um, several of these projects allowed no direct collaboration on text. So that was a sort of a problem. Um, uh, another uh, um, uh, issue is that, that, uh, that, that some of the ones that did allow collaboration on text, they still put people's name on it. Right? So the idea is you'd have an author of an article, and even though anyone could come in and edit the article, because there was an author, people felt that they didn't want to sort of step on other people's toes. So even though there was the technical capacity to, co to collaborate, the idea that there was a name associated with it created like a sort of weak form of intellectual property almost. Right? People didn't want to do it without asking. They wanted, to, they wanted to propose it. They wanted to discuss it first. And as a result, it, allowed, it, it sort of made collaboration on the text very difficult. Now, I don't know if you like, I tried, if you like see us, I mean, you're a bunch of Wikipedians, so you know this, right? When you see a, a sentence in a Wikipedia article that's been there for a long time and you want to find out who added it, it's actually very difficult to do, still, on Wikipedia. Right? Finding out who's responsible for bits and pieces is, is, is very difficult. And not only is that, but, but, but my argument here is that not only is that not, maybe not bad, it actually really helped in facilitating really direct collaboration on text. So, um, failed projects, um, their attribution system created barriers to collaboration. So one person said, in Wikipedia, when you submit content, you don't really get authorship credit directly. You appear in the history, but these things aren't necessarily words. They're just sort of, uh, your, they're just sort of your contribution to Wikipedia. But with everything, their writings were still there. So they had control of them. They received a kind of direct attribution. I think there was some weakness here that people who wrote something, um, and if it was factual content, if they had the information was incorrect, there was no real, I mean, occasionally the editor would go in and change the content. But otherwise, it was sort of up to them to receive communications and re-add it. Um, I saw very similar things from other people. Um, uh, Wikipedia, a number of the people I interviewed said that Wikipedia succeeded because there was this low textual ownership, right? It's like the one, having one article as opposed to several write-ups on a node took advantage of the marginal contributions in a way that everything's not set up to. It really made it a much more strongly many hands make lighter work type of exercise. Someone else says, Wikipedia conquered because anyone could just write anything on any page without anyone's approval. Um, I have lots of quotes here. Um, uh, I want to go to this right here because I think this is sort of this is sort of a nice sort of summary of what I've tried to put up here. Um, the the story here is that we can think of we can think of sort of innovation in terms of the nature of what's being produced in terms of innovation in terms of the product that's being produced or innovation in terms of the process that we're using to build it um, to build it. So 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 established product an established product and an established process is down here. This means we're going to build Britannica. And we're going to build it exactly the way that Britannica works. We're going to create traditional um, uh, authority systems. Oh, sorry. Uh, we're going to build Britannica, and we're going to build it in, in, in the ways that we've done it before. And what people found was, um, and, and those projects really sort of failed to get traction, because they're like, we're going to do Britannica, except we're not going to pay you to do the same thing you'd be doing if you were doing it for Britannica. Um, um, similarly, in the, in the top corner, this is the innovative product and the innovative way. We're going we're to sort of explore new reference works online, and we're going to do it in this really cool, innovative new way, right? And people really struggled to understand like, what was going on there, right? There were too many, all the balls were in the air. And people didn't know what to do, and they didn't really know how to do it. Um, in the bottom, um, the, the ones that succeeded at, um, a, a bit were everything to HGG2 and Wikipedia, which are kind of along that diagonal. You can see they sort of, they sort of held something con uh, uh, um, more or less constant. You, can, you either understand sort of what, how we're doing it, or you understand what we're doing. Um, and, um, but Wikipedia was really the only one that said, we're going to try to build the, the successful, the, the, the old thing, the thing we all know, but we're going to do it in a different way. And I think that if you look at free and open source software communities and peer production more widely, a lot of the big successes are up in that category, uh, up in that top group. So that's that's sort of what I have um, here. As I said, I'm doing more interviews. Um, I'm testing these uh, sort of quantitatively in a big data set of wikis. Um, and I wanted to thank all of you and for everyone who's helped me on this research. So. so good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Hello. My name is Oscar, Oscar Limoke. I come from the Kenyan chapter. But before I Start doing my presentations, I have a few disclaimers to make. I didn't actually want to do this presentation. <laughs> <laughs> you can ask a few, more, a few of my friends around. They've been bothering me. You have to present. One, because I didn't actually know my submission was accepted till like a week before I flew in. I don't know. I don't know who to blame, me or somebody else. No. Two, because I'm, I'm actually shy. I am usually very scared to do a presentation. So I didn't want to really do this presentation, but ironically, I made this submission. Why? I don't know. 
So, enough of that. So I'm gonna share with you something that we've been doing in Kenya. It's, um, it's a really simple project, but it's called um, Offline Wikipedia for Schools. And um, yeah, it's not gonna be complicated like my predecessors who've talked stuff I haven't understood anything. <laughs> I do not have a PhD. Um, just finished my... <laughs> I don't know why you are clapping, you are happy, or you are <laughs> <laughs> kidding me. So like I said, I come from Kenya. I know a couple of you guys do not know where Kenya is. That's the geographical <laughs> position of Kenya. Um, so, so far we've, um, I don't know, let me give you a, a bit of background about the project we are doing. So what we are doing is, um, usually, um, Kenya is a, a country that has um, lots of developments in terms of technology, in terms of mobile development. In fact, we try to brag about if, if somebody here attended the, a session on the other side that was called the African story. Anybody attended that? Yes. Yeah. So we usually brag we are the home of mobile technology all over the world. So ironically, um, internet accessibility in Kenya is not widespread, especially in schools, as it should be. So a bunch of us guys came up with an idea whereby we thought um, <coughs> really many of these students in the Kenyan schools need to, need to have like um, extra content that can supplement and complement their normal, normal um, you know, learning books and stuff like that. But uh, it's really hard to, one, acquire books, two, uh, maybe even computers are hard. As ironic as it may sound, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, my first time to um, see a web page was like five years ago. That's my first time to see a web page. That's the first time I opened you know, a browser, opened maybe an email and did a couple of stuff. So this was um, a, ch um, a challenge many of us shared, and we thought if we could maybe do a small project to the, the schools and you know just take to them content that otherwise most of us were denied, it would really be an awesome um, idea. So we came up with the idea of um, creating, um, um, creating and bundling the offline Wikipedia, initially developed by the, um, the SOS children. And, and, so we did uh, a pilot in Kenya. I'm sh I've shared a, uh, a small sneak map that shows some of the regions that we distributed the offline content, the offline Wikipedia in this case. Um, so those are the, some of the regions. And as one of the questions somebody usually asks me, why did you s choose those regions? Um, I, I never had a good answer, but I just realized um, if you look at those regions, we were a few volunteers who were doing this particular work. And actually, I am. At least one of us came from those regions. So we were, we were selfish because people thought, I need to take one to my, 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 my region, one to my region. So that's um, a geographical distribution of where the initial like, members of Wikimedia Kenya came from. And that's why we did a pilot in their regions. So a little bit of um, what we usually read in, in, in Kenya. Those are the kind of books um, I had to read. Um, I, never liked reading, I never liked reading textbooks. Not because they were there, but because they weren't. So these are the books that the ministry recommends people to read. But ironically, many of the students won't afford or won't even have access to these books. So how, how do you expect them to read? Um, so these are, this is where, again, the, the overall project scope came in, and we decided maybe um, um, as much as the school would like us um, to, to, to find books in these um, particular aspects, Finding these books is one, expensive, and two, many of them, school-going kids um, can't afford them. Maybe their parents can't afford them or something like that. So hence, the offline idea of Wikipedia came in. Um, <clears throat> and then, that's not the, um, the, 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 the whole story to the education system in Kenya. Um, like somebody said in the, in the other side about the African story, um, so I've just shared a, a small picture that shows um, different aspects of the education system in Kenya. To my, to my current right is like um, 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 a village set up of typical schools in, in Kenya, and I believe that's what we are usually um, represented by the Western world. We, they always you know, um, bring about that particular idea. Uh, I'm, I'm not blaming anybody, because I actually schooled from that particular setup, sorry. <laughs> ah, sorry about that. <laughs> I'd asked somebody to cheer me up when my time comes, and I think she's just doing that. Sorry about that. So, uh, like I was saying, 
<laughs> I hope she's not gonna pop up something weird and everybody. <laughs> so to my right is um, a typical like a village setup, and this accounts for like 80% of the education and schooling environment of very many schools in, in Kenya and I believe in Africa. And then to my left is what a few um, schools and students can afford. So you can see those contrasting aspects of the education system in Kenya. So a few pupils, a few students can really afford to, you know, can afford to have a PS2, can afford to have expensive toys, nice toys. And then on the other hand, all we could do was, you know, use our creative minds, our engineering minds that are very tender age to create that track. Um, so that again was another compounding factor that um, helped us and, you know, figure out maybe we could, if we could, pro if kids can, you know, create something like that with no engineering background, no idea how that thing's gonna work, you know. So we thought if we could provide content to some of these um, um, tertiary and um, high schools, these kids um, will have a better idea and better content, not just of what happens in Kenya, but what happens in other um, parts of the world in terms of what they learn, how they do their stuff and, and, and education wise and stuff like that. So, <clears throat> I know some of you are looking at those and wondering, are those computers really still in, 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 in operation? Ironic as it may sound, these are the kind of the latest computers that you may find in our high schools. Ironic, huh? But and then, then again, the idea of offline fits in. We don't need supercomputers. The offline Wikipedia is really as simple. You get the, the, the offline content, and then you get the reader, and then you just bundle it out and deliver to schools. So that wasn't really a big challenge to, 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 to the schools because um, we were doing it for free. However, I'm gonna just share a few of the challenges that we, 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 <coughs> we, we, we encountered. As, as noble as the idea may, may sound, as some of you will say, that's a cool project, that's a, that's a, that's, that's a plus for your education system. Ironically, um, the, the, the very ministry that is concerned with the education did not actually support us. So we just did this out of passion without the support of the Ministry of Education. One is because um, we needed them, they needed us to, they needed the content in the offline Wikipedia to be approved in terms of quality and, and content wise and you know, lo lots of bureaucracy. We didn't have the time to do that. We really needed to do, to, to, to pilot that particular project for us to, 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 uh, to understand whether it's gonna, it's a model that is going to work, whether it's not going to work. And then we really needed to have something to, to going on because we were just this newly bunch of guys who were excited about Wikipedia, had learned about the benefits of Wikipedia and how it could be used to you know, change, um, <coughs> change the world in a small way. So we really just wanted to um, make the change in our own small way. So we encountered um, um, a couple of um, hitches here and there. One of the things we, we encountered was the ministry or the, the secretary for education couldn't just you know, give us the support and stuff like that. But later they gave us the support um, when, the, when we already done the pilot, ironic. So we told them, we already did that. Oh, okay, it's fine, we supported that. <laughs> so ironic. And then <clears throat> I think most of us share with that particular motivation, which is the idea behind um, the whole project for some of us. Um, because I, like I told you, I, I never saw a computer. I never, I never saw a browser. So we just trying. We don't want the, the 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 students and the kids just to learn in the same old ways that we went through. Just because that's what we went through, and here we are. No, no, no. If we teach, let them be taught, or we teach them like we were taught. <sighs> so what what do we do? Ideally, I know I was supposed to share a very complicated and fancy model with you know, very, very schematic and diagrammatic representation of what we do from here, this is what we do. No, 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 we don't do that kind of stuff. We just do very, very easy stuff. So like I, I told you, we have done a small pilot in a, a few regions in Kenya. We have got some feedback from them. And that as, we, as we speak now, we are working on, um, on, on a second iteration of, 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 of based on the uh, feedback we got from the schools and the students. So initially, what we shared was the, the school's um, the offline version of, of Wikipedia that is usually um, based on the UK curricula. It's, 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 it's cool content. How many have ever seen that particular file? If you've ever seen that file, it's, it's, it's usually a good content for high schools and tertiary, um, and tertiary learning institutions. 
But then we got a problem with our schools, the teachers, the, the students. But then very many teachers liked that particular idea because it just meant I could just, he could go to a computer, search whatever he needed to teach or to research on, and then boom. It even made their work easier, some of them. Just go and um, search, get the notes, and then take to the class. They didn't even have to revise some of those notes, some of those teachers. But then <clears throat> um, the challenge we got was uh, that content was actually um, biased towards sorry, the UK curricula, um, which really varies and is slightly complicated than ours. So they told us we really need um, um, a localized uh, version of the offline Wikipedia that addresses the Kenyan sort of syllabus. The students would like to read, would like to have as much information as possible, but then they'd like to pass exams, which is primary while they're in school. So they need something they can read knowing, I can pass exams when I read this, not just reading for the sake of reading. So um, we, we, we so. Another embarrassing moment now, people now have three names, two really hard ones. <laughs> so <coughs> then again, I have to reset my, sorry. Like I said, I wasn't prepared for this sort of presentation, but I'm not going to let you down. So what we are doing is, ah, God. Um, so what we are working on right now is we are working on, um, together with a few chapters, friendly chapters that have um, I, I agreed to support our, our program. They have seen the need for the, our program. Um, we are, at the moment now, um, going through the English Wikipedia, going through the, the, the Kenyan syllabus. The syllabus is just like a teaching guideline that the ministry provides that us, if you want to teach in physics, these are the kind of topics you have to teach. These are the kind of content you have to deliver. So what we are doing, we are, we've, um, we've, we've, we've sort of um, identified the, 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 the teaching guidelines that the ministry has issued. And then um, um, using manual means, as weird as that may sound, so we fish those kind of content in Wikipedia manually. So once we've done that, we are fishing them and collecting them in a central working um, <coughs> meta. That's what we are doing. So we look for articles, for instance, on a course like biology. And then we fish, uh, we, we cross check against the, 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 the syllabus or the content that the school has, the ministry has provided. So it has said you have to teach something on binomial nomenclature, you have to teach something on plant cell and stuff like that. So we actually look for that content on Wikipedia. And then we, we put it here on a central working meta, just done manually by a group of bunch of volunteers. And then after that, um, the generous folks of Wikimedia Switzerland, are they here? They have agreed to, yeah, um, to now bundle that together and create a, a ZIM file. A ZIM file is now the, 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 the file format which the um, offline Wikipedia usually comes in. So the people, the Wikimedia Switzerland is actively involved in that project. They create the bundle up the ZIM file and then they create the ZIM reader, which is like Kiwix, so that reads that particular content. So we are almost done with that particular work. Um, we've had a, um, our volunteers have been working around the clock to make sure we, we have one running in um, a few months. We'll be having like what we can say, this is the Kenyan offline Wikipedia because it addresses the Kenyan curriculum and stuff like that. And we hope we can scale that to maybe the overall East Africa community and maybe Africa because we believe our learnings um, are, are, are s sort of similar. So who are we working with? Like I said, we are just a newly chapter like three months. We've been working um, just a bunch of volunteers without, without re uh, registration or recognition as a chapter. Um, so we are, we are now a chapter, so we are just a group of mm, Wikimedia Kenya guys. Most of them um, my age, none of us have no pun intended, PhD and stuff like that. Um, we are also planning on, you know, because mo some of us have started to have full-time jobs and other engagements is getting hard to volunteer for a full-time um, 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 work to do stuff like that. So we actually, um, <coughs> Now these are things the place that I needed to share the model or stuff like that. So we are planning on using student volunteers and interns. So we, we train them, we teach them what needs to be done. Then once we, 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 we equip them with the ZIM file and stuff like that, we, we, we give them target schools. 
and then the instructions just for them to go and share the, 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 the offline Wikipedia to the schools. Occasionally, the Wikimedia Foundation folks give as a small grant for that. The Ministry of Education is happy because um, we've had a couple of news coverage um, locally and internationally about this particular project. So they're happy when they say we were working with the Ministry of Education when it and doing nothing. So we are working again with them in that particular aspect. Um, a few <coughs> a few civil society guys um, and other stakeholders and friendly chapters, like I said, the, the Swiss chapter. I have three minutes, so those are that's a few of the resources that I could share that uh, have guided on our work. That's the working meta for, for, for the for the Kenyan version and the user manual. Oh, we had to create a user manual, and I'm gonna show you how it looks like. Um, as much as this may sound really basic, um, I was the one who had to create that manual step by step, telling them this is how you unzip the file, this is how you read it, you open it, and you index it. Weird as it may sound, that has been our biggest success, creating that particular user manual for using to that. Because um, in the Kenyan setup, um, teachers and students are like um, the ICT literacy levels are, um, well, not where they're supposed to be. I wouldn't say not so good. Somebody can do Facebook and do Gmail, but when you tell them now, you have to solve this particular application to do this, he doesn't know how to do that. So creating that particular user manual that is in Commons has really been our biggest success in terms of um, scaling out and using, um, you know, making the, the whole project a success. And by the way, we accept um, support from anyone, and any questions and any suggestions are welcome. Thank you, Any question? Not a question, more of a comment, just to congratulate you. I, I mean, there's this author in the United States who, who wrote this book um, called The Lean Startup. And he's making millions going around the country telling people how to make a minimum viable product, you know, the least product you can make that will off offer the value your customers need, right? Uh, so often in the United States, at least, you'll hear people wanting to build something and all they can do is whine about how they don't have enough money or enough resources or enough computers or enough technology or, or, or something, something like that and they never even get started, right? And I mean, we heard some accounts of that in, in the last presentation about how people spent so much time whining about the technology that they never, you know, started delivering the value that their customers needed. You, you went out and figured out how to do this, you know, in some ways, um, uh, doing it the simple way, right? And so just congratulations, way to go. Thank you. I'm sure to extend to the audience. <laughs>